Hello and good day. This was another lesson for our subject media information literacy. First, let us define what is communication. This means sending or receiving information. Communication began as drawings on walls of caves, carvings on barks of trees, and later on, papyrus and parchment. Each of these illustrated man's capacities and desire to interact, link up, and build connections. As population increased, people become more dispersed, thus the developments in communications altered. Today, we associate the word media or mass media to computers, internet, newspapers, magazines, mobile phone, and etc. How people passed on information across change one time after another. It makes media as a way of communication and information evolved. Evolution of media. The term traditional media has become synonymous with seven most common forms of media. Books, newspapers, magazine, sound recording, radio, television, and film. However, in the 1950s, the landscape of media and information technology began to change. The invention of transistor radio in 1948 signaled the development of semiconductor devices, considered the foundation of modern electronics as it led to the invention of integrated circuits, a technology that will be critical in the development of computer, leading to the development of ARPANET and the so-called Internet today, which is the sole reason of rising of the new media today. Basically, there are four ages considered in the evolution of media. First, the pre-industrial age. In this age, people discovered fire, developed paper from plants, and forged weapons and tools with stone, bronze, copper, and iron. Industrial age. In this age, People used the power of steam, developed machine tools, established iron production, and the manufacturing of various products, which includes the books through the printing plant press. Next, Electronic Age. In this age, the invention of the transistor ushered in the Electronic Age. People harnessed the power of transistors that led to the transistor radio electronic circuits, and the early computers. In this age, long-distance communication be became more efficient. Information age. In this age, people advanced the use of microelectronics with the invention of personal computers, mobile devices, and wearable technology. Moreover, voice image sound and data are digitalized the internet paved the way for faster communication and the creation of the social network that we use today let us discuss now the pre-industrial age 3500 bc we have here the cave paintings in prehistoric art the term cave paintings encompasses any parietal art which involves the application of color pigments on walls or ceilings of ancient rock shelters. 2500 BC we have here the papyrus in Egypt. It is a plant which once grew in abundance, primarily in the wilds of the Egyptian delta but also er elsewhere in the Nile River. But it is now quite rare. The papyrus in Egypt is most closely associated with writing. In fact, the English word paper comes from the word papyrus, 
but the Egyptians found many uses for the plant other than writing surface. They used it for documents and text. Papyrus was also used as a food source to make rope for sandals, for boxes, and ba baskets and mats, as window shades, material for toys such as dolls, as amulets to ward off throat disease and even to make small fishing boats. In 2400 BC, we have clay tablets in Mesopotamia. In the ancient Near East, clay tablets were used as a writing medium, especially for writing in cuneiform throughout the Bronze Age and well into the Iron Age. In 130 BC, we have the Acta Diurna. Acta Diurna were daily Roman official notices, a sort of daily gazette. They were carved on stone or metal and presented in message boards in public places, like the Forum of Rome. Next, we have Dibao in China in the 2nd century. In 220 AD, we have printing press using wood blocks. Woodblock wood block printing is a technique for printing texts. Images or patterns were used throughout East Asia and originating in China as a method of printing on textile and later the paper. Next we have, so that is the example of printing in woodblocks. So what they do is they will carve images or letters into each of that wood blocks and they will they will uh, they will apply ink and then they will uh, press it on on clay or sometimes uh, paper or clothes okay let's move on we have on fifth century we have codex in mayan region maya codices are folding books written by pre-Columbian Maya civilization in Maya hieroglyphic script on Mesoamerican bark cloth. So that is the example of their work. And next, we have the Industrial Age. In 1614, we have the newspaper, the London Gazette. The London Gazette is one of the official journals of record of the British government. And most important, such among official journals in the United Kingdom, in which certain statutory notices are required to be published so that is london gazette next in 1800 we have the typewriter the first typewriter to be commercially successful was invented in 1868 by americans christopher latham shows frank haven hall Carlos Glidden and Samuel Soule in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Although Shaw soon disowned the machine and refused to use or even recommend it. So that is the earliest time, earliest type or, or the earliest tool for inputting words or texts. That is the typewriter. So during the 90s, early 90s, some of us are familiar with this. Now, this is being used for typing their research paper, the, the thesis of your parents. So basically, typewriter is the early uh, computer during the earlier days. Okay. Next, we have 
telegraph telegraph is any device or system that allows the transmission of information by coded signal over distance it was developed in 1830s and 1840s by Samuel Morse and other inventors the telegraph revolutionized long distance communication it worked by transmitting signals electrical signals over a wire laid between stations in addition to helping invent the telegraph Samuel Morse developed a code bearing his name that assigned a set of dots and dashes to each letter of the English alphabet and allowed for and allowed for the simple transmission of complex messages across telegraph lines so this code are called Morse code in 1844 Morse sent his first telegraph message from Washington DC to Baltimore, Maryland. By 1866, a telegraph line has been laid across the Atlantic Ocean from US to Europe, although the telegraph had fallen out of widespread use by the start of the 21st century, replaced by the telephone, fax machine, and the internet. It laid the groundwork for the communications revolution that led to those latter innovation. So, telegraph also is one of the means where people can communicate. You know? So, during uh, your your parents also knows this telegraph because during their days, telegraph is one of the main ways to communicate in a far places okay so next we have here the we have the the telephone so we are all familiar with this device called the telephone so who amongst us did uh, did not know this device on march 7 1876 Alexander Graham Bell, scientist, inventor, and innovator, received the first patent for an apparatus for transmitting vocal or other sounds telegraphically, a device he called the telephone. Next, we have, in 1890, we have the motion picture photography. So this motion picture photography uses the illusion of motion pictures. This is based on the optical phenomena known as persistence of vision and the phi phenomenon. The first of these causes the brain to retain images cast upon the retina of the eye for a fraction of a second beyond their disappearance from the field of sight while the latter creates apparent movement between images when they succeed one another rapidly. Together, this phenomena permit the succession of still frames on a motion picture film, strip to represent omnius movement when projected at a proper speed, traditionally 16 frames per second. For silent films, 24 frames per second for sound films. The history of film technology traces the development of film technology from the initial development of moving pictures at the end of the 19th century to the present time. Motion pictures were initially exhibited as a fairground novelty and developed into one of the most important tools of communication and entertainment in the 20th century. Major developments in motion picture technology have included the adoption of synchronized motion picture sound, color, motion, film, and the adaptation of digital film technologies to replace the physical film stack at both ends of the projection chain by digital image, sensors, and projectors. Okay, So, the motion picture photography uses the 
principle of illusion that uh, several drawings has been put on a certain on a certain uh, on a certain wheel huh? so you you uh, if you love drawing on the edges of your books just like what you are doing uh, this motion picture photography has that principle also you're drawing uh, stick figures at the end of or at the corner of your books and then you flip the books making an illusion of which the figures are just like moving so that is the motion picture photography next in 1900 we have the printing press for mass production a printing press is a device for applying pressure to an ink surface resting upon a print medium such as paper or cloth thereby transferring the ink typically used for text the invention and spread of the printing press was one of the most influential events in the second millennium so that is an example of the printing press next we have in 1913 we have the commercial motion picture so that is the example of that next in 1926 we have motion picture with sound a sound film is a motion picture with synchronized sound or sound technologically coupled to in 1913 Edison introduced a new cylinder-based sync sound apparatus known just like his 1895 system as the kinetophone. A sound film is a motion picture with synchronized sound or sound technologically coupled to image as opposed to a silent film. The first known public exhibition of projected sound film took place in Paris in 1900 but decades passed before sound motion pictures were really made into commer in, uh, really made commercial commercially practical reliable synchronization was difficult to achieve with the early sound on this system and amplification and recording quality were also inadequate innovation in sound on film led to the first commercial screening of short, short motion pictures using the technology which took place in 1923 so that is the example next on 1930 we have the advanced punch card Punch card or also known as IBM 011 key punch. This card punch models 1890 through 1930s. These are machines that are that punch holes in stiff papers cards in, in selected position within fixed rows and columns to read to record information that can be read back or interpreted later by other machines called as card readers these are integrated with tabulators computers or other devices punched cards were invented in 750 for the control of textile looms and were adapted for use of Herman Hollerith in 1890 US census although this IBM key punch resembles earlier Hollerith models electricity has been added to lighten the job of punching. Hollerith system opened up an important new field of employment to women starting with the 1890 census. Next, we have the electronic age. Electronic age in 1941 television so we are all familiar with these devices so at least every home has this electronic device television has fulfilled the dream of instantly viewing distant objects and events 
television systems have influenced many aspects of human society enormously, including communications, entertainment, education, the arts, sports, politics, economics, and science. The, uh, this device contributed a large aspect of globalization. Television is now indispensable to our daily life, meaning uh, we cannot live without a television. Professor Kenjiro Takayag Takayanagi is one of the pioneers for the development of television. He achieved most of his work independently of activities in Europe and United States of America because at that time, global communications were poor. Professor Kenjiro Takayanagi started his research program in television at Hamamatsu Technical College, now called as Shizuoka University in 1924. He transmitted an image of the Japanese character E on a cathode ray tube on December 25, 1926, and broadcast video over an electronic television system in 1935. His work, patents, articles, and teaching helped lay the foundation for the rise of Japanese television and related industries to global leadership. When commercial TV began in 1941, New York City had three stations on the air. On Tuesday, July 1, 1941, both CBS and NBC saw their station switch from experimental to commercial licenses. NBC station N2XBS became WNBT and CBS station W2XAB became WCBW. But only NBC was prepared to accept advertisements and sponsors. The cost for an hour of television for WNBP, according to the first rate card issued by NBC, it costs $120 for an hour in the evening, $60 in the daytime, and $90 on Saturdays or Sunday afternoon. So that is our, that is television. Next, in 1947, we have here the transition, transistor radio. So transistor radio is a familiar device to us. Now this is, this is a portable radio or this is a radio which we can listen to uh, when there is no television. So transistor radio is a small portable radio receives receiver that uses transistor-based circuitry. Following the invention of the transistor, the first commercial transistor radio was released in 1954. John Bardeen and Walter Bratain, with support of colleague William Shockley demonstrated the transistor at Bell Laboratories in Murray Hill, New Jersey. The transistor was successfully demonstrated on December 23, 1947 at Bell Laboratories in Murray Hill, New Jersey. Bell Labs is a research arm of American Telephone and Telegraph or what we call the AT&T. The three individuals credited with the invention of the transistor were William Shockley, John Bardeen, and Walter Bratain. Next, in 1945, 1949, I mean, we have the ADSAC. In full electronic delay, in full electronic delay storage automatic calculator, so that is ADSAC, the first full-size stored program computer built at the University of Cambridge, England by Morris, Wilkes, and others to provide a formal computing services for users. ADSAC was built according to, 
to the von Neumann machine principles enunciated by the Hungarian American scientist John von Neumann and like Manchester Mark I became operational in 1949. Wilkes built the machine chiefly to study computer programming issues which he realized would become as important as the hardware details. EDSAC was the first practical stored program electronic computer although not the first stored program computer. The EDSAC's memory consisted of 1,024 locations though only 512 locations were initially implemented. implemented. The instructions were available were add, subtract, multiply, collate, shift left, shift right, load multiplier, register, store, accumulator, conditional, skip, read input, tap, print character, route accumulator, no op, and stop. There was no division instructor and no way to, to directly load a number into the accumulator. So that is EDSAC with the limited commands that it has. Next, in 1951, we have the Univac 1. Univac 1 in full universal automatic computer, one of the earliest commercial computers. So this is the example of Univac 1. After leaving the Moore School of Electronic Engineering at the University of Pennsylvania, J. E. Presper Eckert Jr. and John Mockley, who had worked on the engineering design of the ENIAC computer for the United States during World War II, struggled to obtain capital to build their latest design. A computer they called the Universal Automatic Computer or UNIVAC. In the meantime, they contracted with the Northrop Corporation to build the Binary Automatic Computer or BINAC, which, when completed in 1945, became the first American stored program computer. The partners delivered the first UNIVAC to the U.S. Bureau of the Census in March 1951. Although their company, their parents, and their talents has been acquired by Remington Rand Incorporation in 1950. Although it owed something to experience with the ENIAC Univac, Univac was built from start as a stored program computer. So it was very different architecturally. It used as an operator keyboard and console typewriter for simple or li limited input and magnetic tape for all other input and output. Printed output was recorded on tape and then printed by a separate tape printer. The Univac 1 was designed as a commercial data processing computer intended to replace the punch card accounting machines of the day. It could read 7,200 decimal digits per second making it by far the fastest business machine ever built during that time. Its use of Eckert's mercury delay lines greatly reduced the number of vacuum tubes needed, thus enabling the main processor to occupy a mere 14.5 by 7.5 by 9 feet of space. So that is the Univac 1 or what we call the universal automatic computer. In 1960, we have the mainframe computer. A mainframe computer, a mainframe is simply a very large computer. Mainframe is an industry term for a large computer. The name comes from the way the machine is built up. All units, processing, communication, etc. were hung into frame. Thus, the main computer is built into a frame. Therefore, mainframe, the sheer development costs, 
mainframes are typically manufactured by large companies such as IBM. So we are all familiar with IBM which means International Business Machine, Amdal Hitachi. Their main purpose is to run commercial application of Fortune. 1,000 businesses and other large-scale computer purposes. Think here of banking and insurance businesses where enormous amounts of data are processed, typically at least millions of records, records each day. A mainframe has 1 to 16 CPUs. Memory ranges from 128 MB over 8 GB online RAM. Its processing power ranges from 80 to over 550 MIPS. Historically, a mainframe is associated with centralized computer, centralized computing opposite from distributed computing, meaning all computing takes place physically on the mainframe itself, the processor section. So this is the example of a mainframe computer. Next. In 1968, we have the Hewlett Packard. So that is an example. As you can see, it is it looks like the modern modern cash registers that we have. So what really is a Hewlett Hewlett Packard? In the same time, 1968, when Alan Kay started to dream of his personal computer for children of all ages, the famous manufacturer for electronic devices, Hewlett Packard Company, launched a programmable calculator designed for scientists and engineers who require complex calculations, which is probably the first device in the world called, called personal computer. Programs and data were entered either through a 63-key keyboard or by means of wallet-sized magnetic cards capable of holding up to two complete read or write memory images. Data in the 9100A were represented as decimal floating point numbers with two digit exponents and 12 digits of mantis precision. Results were displayed in a 5 inches electrostatic CRT in three lines, displaying the contents of three registers. Support was provided also for a full complement and arithmetic logarithmic exponential trigonometry, hyperbolic coordinate memory and programming functions. The speed of Calculations was remarkable for the time. Typical add-subtract operations completed in 2 milliseconds. Multiply required 2 milliseconds, square root 30 milliseconds, and trigonomic functions for 330 milliseconds. Conditional and unconditional branching using flags and or arithmetic comparisons were also provided along with rom rom halt, pause, and single step execution. Okay, so basically a Hewlett Packard is the advanced calculator during that time, which can perform more than just addition and subtraction, but also with trigonomic functions and other mathematical operations. Next, we have Apple One. Apple One, so this is the picture of Apple One. It may have been April Fool's Day, but Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, and Ronald Wayne were not joking around when they came together on April 1, 1976 to form Apple Computer Incorporation to sell the Apple One personal computer kit. So as we can see, this is the first, this is the pioneering Apple that we know today. So 
The kits were handed were hand built by Wonzeik and were shown to the public at the Homebrew Computer Club. They went on sale on July 1976. So compared to the Apple today, the first Apple looks like quite simple and more on computer li computer like ish that that we have today. So that is the first Apple computer. Next, in 1984, we have the Dolgoff LCD projector. So with this, the introduction of the LCD technology enabled the creation of the LCD project projectors. Okay, so while liquid crystals were discovered several decades ago, displays made from them became available commercially only in 1960s and 1970s. An early prototype of an LCD projector was presented at the SEED conference in 1972. It was it was a modifi modified slide projector with a matrix addressed LCD and was created by Peter J. Wild. However, early, early models of LCD projectors had low resolution and uh, their LCDs were prone to damages from heat produced by the light source. Dean Dolgoff was another inventor who had been working on creating an LCD projector since the late 1960s. He was able to complete a prototype LCD projector in 1984 when the LCD technology became more refined. He improved upon his design but patented it in 1987 and started his company Projecta Vision Incorporated in 1980. He also licensed the technology to other companies. The first commercial LCD projector called Imagina 90 became available in 1990. Today, Epson and Sony are the two major companies that manufactures LCD for LCD projectors. LCD projectors are popularly used in different avenues. So what is so we have here the Imagina 90 in our picture. Let us now proceed to the information age. In 1993, we have the Mosaic. Mosaic browser was developed in NCSA National Center for Supercomputer Application. It was neither the first web browser nor the first graphical web browser. It was preceded by the lesser known Earwise and Viola WWW. It was the web browser credited with popularizing the World Wide Web. Its clean, easy understood user interface, reliability, Windows port, its simple installation, all, complete, all contributed to making it the application that opened up the world or the open up the web to the general public. Next. In 1980, we have the portable computer laptops. So that is the example. The computer considered by most historians to be the first truly portable computer was the Osborne one. Thighborn book and, so and software up publisher Adam Osborne was the founder of Osborne Computer Corporation, which produced the Osborne One in 1981. It was a portable computer that weighed 24 pounds and cost $1,795. For that, users got a 5-inch screen modem port, two 514 floppy drives, 
a large collection of bundled software programs and a battery pack. Unfortunately, the short-lived computer company was never successful. Okay? So in here, may, we can see there are there are four floppy disk slots here since there are no flash drives during that time data is being uh, stored in a floppy disk a floppy disk is a diskette okay so we have here the a four slot four slot floppy disk and a five inch monitor okay so as you can see this 5H monitor are some, some of our cell phones has larger screens compared to the first laptop that we have here. Okay, so moving on, on 1995 we have the Internet Explorer. Okay, Internet Explorer, so it is a browser and set of technologies created by Microsoft Corporation. A leading American computer software company after being launched in 1995 Internet Explorer become, became one of the most popular tools for accessing the internet there were 11 versions between 1995 and 2013 so this is the first Internet Explorer during that time so I have seen this Microsoft during my grade 6 days so this was or this was yes this was the internet explorer that we used during that time okay next we have in 1996 we have the google google we are all very familiar with this search engine so google played a crucial role in shaping the modern internet and still playing its role Today, the way we live our lives, the way we search or look for things is mostly because of Google. It began in the year 1996 when two of the brightest minds at Stanford University in California, Larry Page and Sergey Brin developed a search algorithm at first known as Backrub. With the help of two friends, Scott Hassan and Alan Stremberg, the word Google has no full form but it's generated from the word Google, which means a huge number. The word Google was misspelled and later and later decided to use it as company's name. Google.com was registered in the year 1997 and later incorporated in 1998. The company initially started in the garage of a friend named Susan Wojcicki in Menlo Park, California. So that is Google. 1999, we have the Blogspot. Pyra Labs launched a program called Blogspot. In 1999, that would let people run their own blogs. The program was bought by Google in 2003 and changed to Blogger in 2006. What is most interesting about this tidbit will be, I won't mention it in the podcast, but it, it was brought to their attention that after the weekend recordings were made, it was brought to us a social network world of today and needed to be talked about okay, so this is the first blogging spot or the first blogging site in history so that is blog spot wherein you can put your essays your uh, any form of, of media you can put it there on blog spot okay. next we have the live journal live journal is a community publishing platform willfully blurring the lines between blogging and social networking. In 1999, LiveJournal has been home to a wide array of creative individuals looking to share common interests, meet new friends and express themselves. 
Life Journal encourages communal interaction and personal expression by offering a user-friendly interface in a deeply customizable journal. The surface or the, the service individuality stems from the way highly dedicated users utilized our simple tools along with the instinct of individual expression to create new avenues for social for online socializing. Next, we have so, so that is lifejournal.com. Next, we have Friendster. So, who among who amongst us remember this uh, social media platform, which is the Friendster? You know? So, this is the first social media that I have known. I have known since. 2000, early 2000. Okay, so Friendster, Friendster was launched by Jonathan Abram and Peter Chin in Mar March 2002. The site was built on the promise that people were separated by six degrees. A feature that showed how you were connected to strangers made meeting people less intimidating and highly addictive. It was also considered a safe way to meet potential dates online. Unable to scale the service at the same rate as demand, the site encountered many technical hiccups. Frustrated users began migrating away from the popular social network and, and moved on to its rival MySpace. The company is still credited as giving birth to the modern social media movement. In May 2011, the site, the site abandoned user profiles and transitioned into social entertainment site. So during the earlier age or the earlier time, early 2000, Friendster is a Friendster is like the Facebook of our time. But several years passed, uh, profiles there were deleted, and Friendster became a gaming website okay, wherein you can play many online games on this social platform okay so next we have wordpress so that is wordpress the story of wordpress tells us how open source communities work to make something so useful without compromising software freedom. WordPress project is driven by a community of dedicated developers, users, and supporters. On May 27, 2003, Matt announced the availability of the first version of the WordPress. It was well received by the community and was based, was based on B2 Cafelog. With significant improvements, the first version of WordPress included a new admin interface, interface, new template, and generated XHTML 1.1 compliant templates. Next, in 2004, we have Facebook. Okay, so Facebook. American company offering online it is an American company offering online social networking services. Facebook was founded in 2004 by Mark Zuckerberg, Eduardo Saverin, Dustin Moskowitz, and Chris Hughes, all of whom were students at Harvard University. Facebook became the largest social network in the world with more than 1 million users as of 2012 and about half number were using Facebook every day. The company's headquarters are in Menlo Park, California. Next, in 2005, we have YouTube, a website for sharing videos. It was registered on February 14, 2005 by Steve Chen, Chad Hurley, and Jawed Karim three former employees of the American e-commerce company PayPal. 
They had the idea that ordinary people would enjoy sharing their home videos. The company is headquartered in San Bruno, California. As content and photo sh sharing sites were taking off in 2005, the founders of YouTube noticed a small problem. There was an explosion in the number of expensive and inexpensive ways to capture video, but there wasn't a good way to share videos. The company rose like a rocket ship after its founding in 2005 and was brought by it in the end was bought by Google 18 months later. Under Google, YouTube went from being a repository of amateur video to a powerhouse of original content. Today, in its 15-year history, YouTube has become the undisputed king of online video. YouTube is the largest online video destination in the world and the third most visited website overall. The site exceeds 2 billion views a day, nearly double the prime, the prime time audience of all three major, major US networks combined. The platform comprised or comprises the large video sharing community in the world and includes users, advertisers, and over 10,000 partners. Every minute, 24 hours of video uploaded to the site. Hundreds of millions of users spanning the globe come to YouTube to discover and shape the world through video. Next we have, so that is YouTube. We are familiar with that website. So uh, we do think that we know some Philippine bloggers here in our country. You know, like Kong TV, Big World Testing, Payaman, Chai. Jaiga and many more. Next, we have <coughs> microblogs. Microblogs, or what we know today as Twitter, is an online microblogging services for distributing short messages among groups of recipients via recipients via personal computer or mobile telephone. Twitter incorporates aspects of social networking websites such as MySpace and Facebook with instant messaging technologies to create networks of users who can communicate throughout the day with brief messages or what we call the tweets. A user types a tweet via mobile phone, keypad, or computer and sends, sends it to Twitter's server, which relays it to the list of other users known as followers who have signed up to receive the sender's tweets by either text messages to their mobile phones or by instant messages to their personal computers. In addition, users can elect to track specific topics, creating a dialogue of sorts and pushing the number of followers in a given Twitter feed into millions of tweets, maybe on any subject ranging from jokes to news to dinner plans but they cannot exceed 140 characters. Twitter was built using Ruby on Rails, a specialized web application framework for the Ruby computer programming language. Its interface allows open adapt adaptation and integration with other online services. The service was designed in 2006 by Evan Williams and B. Stone each of whom worked at Google before leaving to launch the podcasting venture audio. Next, next, in 2007, we have Tumblr. So if you are familiar with this, Tumblr is a New York based internet platform part microblog, part social network which was created by web developers David Karp and Marco Arment and launched in 2007. Due to the company's almost immediate success and popularity, it was acquired by technology giant Yahoo Incorporate, incorporated in June 2013 for the sum of 1.1 billion US dollars. The site launched in 2007 under David Karp 
who dropped out of high school at the age of 15 and got Tumblr up and running when he was 20. Tumblr's blog-like function allows account holders to use the platform in order to create diaries of their daily lives to post different types of information that inspires them as well as to live blog about events as they happen or about TV shows as they are aired. The platform supports several different types of posts such as text posts, plain or accompanied by images, hyperlinks or videos but also photo posts, quote, fold, quote posts, link posts and chat posts, audio posts and also video posts. Whether uploaded from a device or imported from websites such as Vimeo or YouTube, the social media functions allows users to like or to reblog a post. Another function permits communication between different accounts although users can also choose to keep their content private. The website also uses followers based system made famous by Twitter where interested users can follow other users blog whether they are friends, strangers or even celebrities. Last one we have the Google Hangouts. Google Hangouts Google rebranded re Hangouts as a new unified cross-platform cross messaging system. It lets people text, photo, and group video message across Hangouts, Android, and iOS apps. Plus, its Gmail and Google Plus site integration, Hangout rolls out today, replacing Google Talk or Gchat and G Plus Messenger. While it doesn't support SMS yet, it could challenge Facebook messaging and Apple's iMessage. The Hangout app will present users with a list of recent text conversations instead of a contact list. Rather than something like Google Talk, this has more mobile messaging DNA. Each conversation gets its own name like a chat room and can be labeled with an image or the Google's new emoji. Hangouts will store all conversations in the cloud and allow users to message friends in any time even if they are not connected. Users can visit past conversations and access shared photos and video call history thanks to Google's iCloud. Hangouts will sync everywhere giving people access to conversations on any device so the tagline for the service is conversations that last with people that you love. So that is that is Google Hangouts. Let us now go to Internet of Things. So Internet of Things Tech, define, tech Target defines it as the burgeoning environment in which almost any entity or object can be provided with a unique identifier and the ability to transfer data automatically over the internet. It is extending the power of the internet beyond computers and smartphones to a whole range, whole range of other things processes and environments it is simply means taking all the things in the world and connect them connecting them to the internet mcclellan 2020 so how does iot or internet of things work so what are the different examples of so, um, IoT works first by uh, IoT devices gather data and send it through the internet for processing. The, the next one is data is analyzed centrally. And number three, 
instruction based on analysis are returned to the internet. So what are the different examples of IoT? Essentially, anything that's capable of gathering some information about the physical world and sending back home can participate in the Internet of Things. IoT extends internet connectivity beyond traditional devices like desktop, laptop, computers, smartphones, and tablets to a range of devices to communicate and interact with the external environment all via the internet. Through its connection to the internet, these devices can communicate with each other by sending and receiving data. Common examples of IoT device would be Amazon Echoes, Fitbit watches, connecting connected cars and enhanced smart parkings. IoT or Internet of Things devices can dramatically improve our lives. For instance, say goodbye to manually operating a different device for every task. Remove the thing, remove the needs to carry keys by having a smart lock for or from controlling your thermostat to tuning up the volume of your television from all from your phone increase efficiencies in by decreasing the amount of time normally spent performing the same task. For example, voice assistant like Google Home or Amazon's Alexa can provide answers to your questions without you needing to pick up your phone. Smart refrigerators and Amazon Dash can facilitate convenience by reordering grocery items. Another benefit is improving our wellness where for example wearing a smartwatch or Fitbit bracelet is a good idea to keep a healthy lifestyle and check our personal data routines. So that is the Internet of Things. So as we can see here, what are the different examples of IoTs in our surroundings? First, we can use IoT in home and building automation. Just like when we use Alexa, for example, Alexa lights on. Okay, so Alexa or the, the system will be receiving the data and then and then uh, it will be executed in the device itself. The next one will be the smart energy. Uh, these are some devices that is being plugged in our, in our uh, electric uh, connections to save energy. Next, we have the multimedia. Wireless audio streaming and advanced remote controls, just like our Bluetooth speakers, uh, wireless remote controls, so that is in multimedia. In security and safety, we have the uh, web or we have the CCTV cameras um, connected to the internet, wherein we can uh, we can see and we can we can stream uh, the live feed from our house straight to our cell phones if we have the data. Next is the industrial M2M communication. Okay, so I do hope that uh, you have learned something from our lesson for this week. So this has been your teacher, uh, Sir Ben Aluya, and uh, I do hope that you have learned a lot from this chapter. See you next week. Bye!